All right, good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for the late start. Um, we're about to get started. Could you go to school, Ajay? I don't know how many may have checked before coming on. Um, I uploaded some figures that will make navigation this afternoon a little easier. So if you go there, all right, so there are some diagrams and some other stuff that um, you we won't you know spend time. But a bit difficult for you to draw them anyway. So I've put them there. I'm going to change up, change the format a bit in that we will look at um, overcurrent relays um, today. I'm sorting something out. Just give me a minute here. <laughs> All right. All right, so we're going to be talking about, about all current relays. Have you seen the, the figures as yet? Have you not, not as yet? Yes, sir. All right, good. Well, let's say we're going to be looking at all current relays today. Um, that should take us the full three hours this week, but we'll see how far we get uh, this afternoon. Some of the stuff you have already heard because I have been so the crisscrossing um, with some of the material. All right, so some we will not spend a lot of time on. So uh, overcurrent relief. Now we talked about. Excuse me, sir. Remember to record these. Ah. <laughs> Recording in progress. Thank you very much for that, Mr. You saw me way down the wicket. And I got stumped just now, eh? All right. So, over current release. Now, um, we may have mentioned the whole business of um, unit protection. You know, you're looking at a specific point or a specific um, component within your protection system. The Overcurrent relay, we use that primarily for non-unit single point relay. Um, so it gives coverage in many instances, not just to a single device, but it may give coverage to a section of your power network. All right. Um, by themselves, the, uh, the relays monitor the measured power um, system current or the, the current flowing through a particular point um, in our network, yes, um, and in order to get full coverage, there is need for what we refer to as coordination. Now, what, what does that really mean? Um, within our network, we are going to have transformers, yes? We have generators at different points. It therefore, stands the reason that you'll have different magnitudes of current passing through different points um, on the network. Similarly, when you have a fault, the fault current flowing through the system is going to be different depending on where in the network you are located. And you would have you would have seen that from your um, from your last lab. Yeah? You look at different points on the network depending on whether you are looking 
um, you know, decided that a transformer you're looking, um, you know, we don't really need to go into all of that. But the bottom line is you have those differences. So it means, therefore, that if you have overcurrent relays within the system and we want to achieve what we would have spoken about uh, some time ago, which is um, discrimination, you want to ensure that only the right part or right portion of the circuit is removed from service. And when I say right portion, I mean that portion that is um, uh, that is on the fault, right? Um, the fact that we have fault current passing through uh, a particular point in the network doesn't necessarily mean that it is on the fault. Do you think? Because the fault current needs to pass through certain parts of the network in order to get to the fault point. So to, to ensure proper discrimination, to ensure that only the fault section is removed, we go through this exercise um, when using overcurrent relays known as uh, coordination. Okay? Now, um, there are three basic types, and we mentioned them last week, right? So in terms of the, the, their, their operation, we have instantaneous, we have definite time, and we have um, overcurrent relays, which, are, which carries an inverse characteristic. So for, for the instantaneous, it simply means that once the, the current exceeds a particular value, then we are going to have operation. All right. Um, for the for the definite time, again, once it exceeds the preset value, then it gives a specified time um, within which or after which it will operate. And then finally, for the inverse characteristics or the inverse relays, as the current increases, the operating time um, is reduced. Okay, so our main focus this, this afternoon into this evening will be on the inverse relays. And for your inverse relays, right, um, obviously they, they have, they have um, the greatest utility in, 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 uh, in, in our power systems, right? So you'll find them used mostly our power systems. The, the others are usually in industrial settings. Eh? But for your power system, of course, as the you know current increases, you want the operation time or operating time of your relay to be reduced. Um, and in terms of the the, the 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 name that is applied, I just mentioned inverse characteristics, but the proper name is the inverse definite minimum time or IDMT um, relay. Okay? And I just chose that for this, not necessarily that that is an IDMT. Yeah. So in in terms of um, in terms of the, 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 the systems of protection, as I mentioned, the instantaneous and um, definite time um, are used with with your your IDMT um, and auto reclose schemes so for feeders and by feeders we are now moving from the transmission to the distribution side of things. But um, although I make the statement, I still want to underline the fact that in terms of use within the power system, what you are going to see is primarily inverse relays. All right. All right. So the, the inverse release, we further delineate the, 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 the characteristics by those inverse characteristics by identifying three types. Yep. Now, you do have some further variations, but in terms of uh, the three standards on their inverse release, you are going to have your standard inverse, 
going to have your very inverse, and you have your extremely inverse characteristics. As I said, and I, and I think I've highlighted it here, that it's not limited just to these three, but these three are what we would say are you know at the forefront. So your standard inverse, very inverse, and extremely inverse. And in terms of the, please let me know if I'm going too fast. You know. right. In terms of the characteristics, this is what they would look like. All right. So you have your standard inverse. And note that they are, they are starting at the same point. Eh? So they have the same starting point. But the characteristics differ significantly. So you have your standard inverse up top, then the very, and then the extremely inverse. What we have also done is to superimpose the, the characteristic of the fuse on it. And you, you, you will see that uh, for the fuse, let's take a little bit of touch for this thing. Uh, uh, that's not what I want. Anyway, <laughs> I'll figure it out where it's to go. No um, yeah, so the characteristics are shown. Yeah. Um, the, the, the fuse is superimposed because one of the things we, we, we will note um, later on is that the extreme inverse is usually used in networks or parts of the network that you have fuses as part of the, the, the protection system. So where you have fuses and you are also going to be using relays, then you would use the extreme lean first. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the whole um, activity of coordination okay, will require that you're going to use characteristics that are close together because that will reduce the challenge or the difficulties uh, associated with, with coordination. So let's let's just um, recap what we said so far. One, you, the the overcurrent relays, you have them as instantaneous. You have definite time, and you have inverse relays. Good, inverse relays refer to them as IDMT. That's your inverse definite minimum time, and then for your um, inverse relays. The characteristics we just mentioned, you have very inverse, standard inverse, and extremely inverse. All right? Any, any questions so far? Any comments? Anything you want to clarify before I go any further? No? All right. Now, for your static relay, the, 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 the characteristics that I just showed, yes, they are derived empirically. So, you know, this would, these, these characteristics for your, for your electromechanical, yeah, you would be getting it from experimental data based on the, the design of, of the relays. Yeah? However, when we now start dealing with static relays, the approach is a little different. So those curves that I just showed you, which you would have gotten with the with the with the um, the electromechanical, these curves are now derived using equations. So for your standard inverse, that's the equation. All right, so we have 40, 0 0.14 T, 0 0.14 times T over IF divided by T I N to the point zero 0.02 minus one. 
And that gives you the operating time of the relay. So the operating time for your standard, 0.14 T, I of I F over P I N to the point zero two minus one. And we we define this um like you know what. So I'm not taking notes, Mr. Duncan. Okay. Okay. All right, and um, finish with that. For the very inverse, we have 13.5 T divided by IF over P times IN minus one. So for this one, you have um, the IF over P IN is raised to the power one, 13.5 T. And then for the extremely inverse, we have E to T, over IF divided by PIN squared minus one. So for your static release, this is how we define um, our curves. So the characteristics that you get, all right, are derived from these equations. All right, now, by way of definition of these variables that you see there, IF will be fall current as seen by the relay. So you can, um, you can either consider this on the, in terms of what is happening on the primary side, or the secondary side of the, of the CT. So you can look at it in terms of what's on the system vis-a-vis -vis what's on the, 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 um, the secondary side of the relay. Oh, sorry, the secondary side of the CT. It, it will work out to be the same. So I end there would be the, the, the um, the nominal setting, nominal really occurring, really operating current, big T, time multiplier, and P is a plug scale multiplier, or the really is setting current. Um, in, 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 in fairness, P, I, N <coughs> would really give it a plug setting. So, um, so it would be I, F over I, N. So that would really give it a multiplier. Are you with me? So what we call here the plug scale multiplier, um, that, that's a sort of old term because we now know that we can get the plug setting directly from the relay. So we know the operating current of the relay. So what the, what the denominator, what the denominator is really giving you, right? What we're getting here would really be the plug setting, right? And so IF over PIN would be giving you the multiplier in terms of what you are seeing during the fall. But I'm giving you the PIN because the example that we use uses uh, we require that information. But you know, don't get too thrown off by it.
right. So in terms of in terms of the the the, the earlier types that we'll be looking at, yeah. So we have we have that for your analog or not the, well for your electromechanical, we derive those. Alright. And then for your static, we use the, the, the formulae. Okay. Now, just to make a couple a few more comments regarding the um the, the, the three inverse characteristics. We have here we are showing the, the saturation curves in terms of the um the, the relay CT output to the relay, right? So that's saturation CT with your standard, your very and your extreme inverse characteristics. Why, why are we mentioning this? And you have the diagram, right? So just make a note that you you, go, you reference that particular diagram. Right? So for your standard inverse. Your standard inverse is going to show what we refer to as appreciable tolerance to CT saturation. So we are running the risk of having your CTs saturated. The, 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 um, the standard inverse really, you know, we'll, 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 we'll treat with it. For your very inverse, Use the feeder protection. It allows you to have an operating time which is proportional to the distance of, of the fall position. So we, we talk not about a feeder because the feeder, um, you know, primarily radial feeders would have a source point. And that source point really is with respect to the, um, the well, call it a transformer, because you're not really going to be connected into a generator at a feeder. So a feeder will be coming from a substation. So it's really a transformer point that you're looking at. Um, so you are, you are then, as you go along that feeder, what you're doing is moving further and further away from the source. You see? And if you're moving away from the source, then it means that the, you're going to have increased resistance and therefore the, the, the current flow will change. And also the fault, that the fault current that you're going to experience along the feeder will change as you move away from the source. Okay, so your your very inverse that those characteristics um, provides for use um, on feeders, and with the extremely inverse, as I mentioned before, because their characteristics are so close, where you have systems, yes, that you have fuses as part of that uh, protection architecture. That's where you are going to find the use of your extremely inverse relays. Uh, now, we have made two attempts so far to show you um, kind of up close what your overcurrent really looks like. And you know, quite frankly, this doesn't, this doesn't, um, I mean, it, it just, the, the picture I'm about to show really just highlights the fact that it is an uh, electromechanical relay. Um, 
we will try our best to show that it's really a, a, an overcurrent. But anyway, so I believe this is this is by far the best <laughs> uh, photo I, I have of 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 your uh, electromechanical. All right? did, did you finish writing this up? Right. So I think this is the best photo I've had so far. Right. Um, even though it's not, it's still not that good, but we, we work with it. So we have we have our disk. Yeah. Um, uh, let me see if the let me see if the, um, Let me let me let me jump to the to the other one because I think that one may look a little bit. I'll come back to it. Ah. So if you look at the top, again, I don't know if you had seen it in the previous um the previous attempts I made, but up here, can you see the dial up there? So that is a dial right at the top. Yes, sir. All right. And that is what you would turn in order to get the time setting. And remember what we said is that in, 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 in shifting that dial, all you are doing is moving the movable contact closer to the fixed contact. So the movable contact, which is... Oh, Lord. <laughs> Boy. They have their benefits and their faults. It is difficult to see the move of the contact. But anyway, it is fixed. If you look right here, um, look right here, right? you can see the shaft that it is on. And so the move of the contact is fixed onto that. When you turn the dial, you're shifting it closer to the fixed contact. It's difficult to see. You really need to come into the lab. So next you come into Kingston, we will go into the lab and I can show you this up front. Um, up front and personal, all right? You plan to come to Kingston and uh, are you all in? I, I'm sure I asked this question already. You know. Who is in Kingston? Nobody? What no, more? No, sir. Four more. All right. Anyway, if you decide to come by UTEC, um, you, you, you can, whenever you come, we can go to the lab and, uh, and I'll show it to you. Anyway, this is what this is what it looks like. Let me go back to, to the point, though. Uh, we already said it, so it's something new. We know that the electromechanical works like the water meter. The larger the current, the faster the, the, the disk is going to turn, all right, which is this. Oops. All right, so you have the disc, which is going to turn much faster than the higher the current. These are those braking magnets uh, to prevent uh, overshoot. All right, the contacts are in here. Okay. So you higher the current, the faster it moves, which is why the, the inverse relationship. All right. And obviously, the faster it moves, the quicker. It, it will operate. Um, so, key students, when we are setting our overcurrent relay, there are only two values we are looking for. And I think we have already spoken about that. Eh? We're going to give the current setting, which we already know, the top setting. Yeah? Are we going to get time setting? Now, so far, so far, with the power systems are in the discussion that I've had um, in protection. So far, I've only told you about the, the, the current setting, and we have looked on the curves with those top settings, the, the time dial settings, right? That's all we have done so far. What we're going to do this afternoon is to take it one step further. 
Rather than me saying to you, well, the time setting is 0 0.5 or 1 or 2, we're going to go through an exercise to say how exactly we determine those values, which time setting we are going to put it on. All right, so we're going to go through an exercise which, um, you know, we'll we, we, we highlight how that is done. All right? We good so far? Well, I tell you, you know, I, I like you guys, but at the same time, I don't like you all. You know, too quiet, man. I don't want you to work much at it, you know, but, yeah, you know, you all too quiet, man. Yeah. yeah. And that's not because I go to a nice church. But anyway, let's move on. Um, so in terms of your block diagram, yep, yeah, sorry, this is what it, it would look like. You have your tab, your plug block, right? your plug block, and depending on which one of these you put the plug in, and it's a physical plug. It is, it is a, a metal plug that you actually unscrew and then screw it into one of those uh, boards. All right? So that's how we call it plug. So, so in terms of what we do, what we use, we get the name plug, yeah? In terms of what it is doing physically, what it is doing is tapping off a portion of the winding. So that's why we also call it the tap setting because it's tapping off the winding. You with me? So it's plug or tap. And then of course, here's your rotating disc and your, um, your, 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 your magnets and you name it, right? So this is what the electromechanical looks like. So the, 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 the basic principle, whether, whether or not I'm using electromechanical or, or static relays, the basic principle remains. I must be able to define the curve and the curve is going to be defined by the electromechanical in terms of empirical data. Or, as we will see in a few minutes, well, we did say earlier, um, for the static, we define it using the curves, the, the equations. So, in terms of the static, the question is, what, what technology am I going to use to define the curves? All right? For the, for the electromechanical, we know we, based on the, the, uh, the design parameters, et cetera, et cetera, we can derive empirically what the curves will be. For your static, the question is, how do we represent the mathematical formulae that I showed you earlier? So the, the current setting for your relay, Yes, um, is known as the plug scale multiply, multiplier. So that's one way of, of, of referring to it. But of course, the plug scale multiplier times the, the nominal current really gives you the top current or the plug current. All right? And then the time setting is your time multiplier setting. That's a big T. So these are the two numbers. These are the two values that we are going to need to determine for our overcurrent relay. Once we know that, then we set them, uh, the system operates, and based on the settings that we have, it will discriminate as, as, as we wish, um, and that comes through coordination. All right? Now, in terms of your overcurrent relay, and we mentioned this last week or the week before, when we're looking at the evaluation of your CT. We said that for your electromechanical, it has a very high burden, and the burden changes depending on the amount of current that is, um, that is, 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 is flowing to, to it. Right? The, the, electro, the electromechanical relay, it derives power from the power system itself and therefore operates with a very high burden, all right? So it has a very high burden. 
the, the example I'm about to show you, um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm the first to admit it's quite convenient. Yes. Um, but anyway, you will get the picture. So if we have an overcurrent relay, there's a burden of one VA at the setting current. All right, so at the setting current, we have one volt ampere. If we assume the input impedance to be constant, then the burden at 10 times the setting current It's going to be equal to I squared over ZS. Now, if we then see a current, which is 10 times the setting current. So if we then have an input current, which is 10 times the setting current. We then have a burden of 100 VA. And based on what we, we looked at a couple weeks ago, where we said, where we showed that, um, where we showed that the, 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 the burden, yes, really a burden which is going to add to the, 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 the overall or, or put additional strain on the CT, has the potential of raising, whether it is VGH or VEF, but it has the potential of causing our CTs to saturate. Eh? So we, we have to take that into consideration when using electromechanical. And quite frankly, you know, I mean, I should confess, you're hardly going to find many of these um, in, in industry today, but, you know, we still have a duty to let you know that um, because, you know, you're going to find that, 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 that industrial facility which uses these types of relays. And whether you are tasked with, with transitioning or um, facilitating their continued use, you know, you, you at least have some passing knowledge of them. So in terms of the, the, the impact, as I said, we have shown that by looking at um, that example of, 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 of assessing the operation of your of your CT. All right. Okay. So next we talk about um, static relays. So we have just dealt with the electromechanical, um, and we have been talking about it quite a bit. Yes, a lot of what I have said. I know it's repeated material. Um, now we want to move to your static relays. So under static, we want to start firstly by referencing your analog relays. And these relays would use your transistor, your up-amp circuits. Okay. Now, when we compare the static relays, the analog relays to your electromechanical. Okay. We see that the static relays have some benefits. 
low burden, improve curve repeatability, obviously, because with your electromechanical, although you would have gotten the, um, the, the, the characteristics or you would have derived the particular characteristic empirically, it would have been under certain operating conditions, including, including temperature, you know, uh, pressure. Yeah. If, the, if those change, then the possibility of you getting slight deviation from the, the expected um, curve, you know, that may occur. It may not be significant, but it still occurs. So with your analog, you will have a greater chance of improved curve repeatability. Um, reduce frequency errors. Less susceptible to temperature, as I mentioned before. And of course, it makes the relay smaller. So when you look at when you look at um, um, well, what kind of sure let me not use that. But earlier I showed you the 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 um there's a static relay, nice and cute. But then when you come to the electromag electromagnetic, they are quite bulky. Uh, very bulky. So that's one benefit of your analog relays. So it, re it, it allowed the size of the relay to be reduced. All right? Um, if you go into many other substations um, within, the, within our utility company, you'll see a lot of space in the relay rack. As a matter of fact, in, in many instances, or in some instances, rather than leaving the space, they just leave the whole relay, even though it isn't doing anything. So it's there. Because the newer relays, what you would have needed, um, three electromechanical, you now use one, which is, measure, which is monitoring all three phases. You had an electromechanical per phase. Yeah? So those are some of the, 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 the benefits. Um, on, on the flip side, obvious reasons, you know, the, 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 the analog would be more expensive. Right. Whilst the electromechanical derived its, its, its operating power from the, the system, which in of itself, can be seen as a drawback, all right? Because you 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 would need the provision of a well. This well, I was gonna make a foolish statement because even though you needed the station transformer, you still would need it for the for the uh, analog because those will be used to maintain your batteries. Right? So in addition to the analog being more expensive, needing the battery bank, they're also less robust for obvious reasons. Yeah. I don't, well, you know how easy it is to destroy a transistor radio, right? As against the one that your grandfather had. And if he's still alive, still has. Huh? Uh, but I know I, I know I'm shooting over your head, but you know, we yes, we did have radios with tubes, but you know, moving right along and doing so rather quickly. So this is what your analog would look like. And note the distinction where we say we are using up arms. So you have this figure. Right? We're using up arms, we are using transistors. Good. So, you know, we have we have our input circuit from, from our CT. Yeah? And then we have our uh, loading resistor. We have our curve shaping circuits. Yes. And by that, we are talking about integrators, differentiators, all of that fancy jazz. Yep. Um, you have your ICs. 
Um, of course, you have to power all of that. Okay. And then over here is where you now have the um, contacts. So the, 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 the actual fall current doesn't flow through the relay. All right. So the, the contacts, which then closes your, um, your, your, your circuit for you to trigger or to operate your, um, your circuit breaker. Okay? So basic structure of your analog relay. All right? Key difference with what we are going to be talking about in a few is that for this relay, you are using transistors and that whole other technology. All right? That's the basic, basic difference. But so remember, we, we spoke about the two settings, your plug setting and your time setting. All right? So your time setting would have been um, provided there. And the plug setting, this is the loading resistor that we're talking about. Let's see if I can erase this thing. Ah, finally I get it. All right. So your plug setting will be a standard. Right. That's what we would adjust. For your for your for your analog. And then for your time setting, you know, it's it's internal in terms of the decision making circuit. Okay? So we have we have now spoken about the electromechanical. And yes, we have done that several times. Um and now we're talking about the analog. The, the last thing I want to mention about the analog is that, and I, and I spoke to it just now, um, in terms of the, the contacts external to the relay, right? Um, which energize your trip circuit for your, for your breakup. Right? So the last thing we mentioned there, so it uses that hinged armature, which provides isolated output contacts. So you're gonna find these mainly in, in a factory setting. They are good enough. And at one point in time, as a matter of fact, many of these relays, when they came into, into, into the current utility, they, they, they didn't last very long. So they came in and went very quickly because they were replaced by what is now there, which are your uh, digital relays. All right? Uh, and, and it could very well be because we didn't start changing all the older meters until um, in the 90s, 2000. Right? So by then, persons were now using digital, so the, the analog didn't last very long. Okay? So thirdly, we don't know about the digital release. Right. And you know, as 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 you'd expect, we're now dealing with chips, microprocessors, yeah. Um, and in the same way, we have um, your your um, your uh, your curve shaping circuits with these mini computers in terms of the microprocessors we are now able to hold the curve data in them. The benefit of that is that with my digital relay, I can now select whether or not I want to use a standard inverse 
a very inverse or an extremely inverse on the same device. If I was using a standard inverse for my electromechanical, I would have to change, change out the relays if I were using extremely before. But now, if I want, I can buy one set of relays. And if I want extremely, or if I want standard, yeah, I can make the selection. Okay? Um, a lot more robust than, than the analog. I can't speak, well, you know. Maybe it was just a matter of money at the time because, you know, JPS really didn't start getting capitalized in a meaningful way until in the 1990s, right? which is when the, 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 the government gave up the majority of its shares. All right? And then you start having private capital coming in. That's when all this change and, you know, started to occur. So it could very well just be a matter of money why, you know, that transition through the, 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 the analog didn't, didn't occur. But when you go there and start working, you let me know. All right. So in terms of in terms of the 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 um the, the operation you have here on, on the microprocessor that you now have your We simply uh, switch the values of the CT loading resistance, which we, which we showed here. Right? So that's your plug setting. We just you know, switch one. And depending on how many you have in parallel, then you would get um, the, 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 the current that would be required, a change in the current that would be required to operate your ready. Um, your time setting. It's just a matter of selecting your curve setting, a matter of selecting. So again, in terms of capital cost, it may be a little more expensive, but in terms of the operational flexibility, you know, it, 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 it will be worth it. All right. And as I mentioned before, it's not, although I show it as, as, as switching, it is not necessarily a physical um, selection but rather uploading of the data to the relay. All right. So you have, as I mentioned, the selectable curves. You have all three available. We have already spoken about the burden advantage, whether it is the analog or the digital. It doesn't matter. All right? Just as good. Um, we require this separate power supply. So, of course, you know, you'd still have to get information or, or have an appreciation of, um, of, of, of battery maintenance. And I hold up my hand and declare that I am one poor engineer who needs to go to some work on battery technology. Right. Um, I'm, I am horribly where that is concerned. But anyway, I'll get there. Or I'll just continue to buy the service. Right. Okay. So we want to know jumping and sort of jumping with both feet in looking at you know how we go about setting uh, your overcurrent really. You know, what, what do we do? What what what, what is, is this thing we talk about grading? Huh? And at, 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 at the core, it's just that we, we want to make the selection that will protect our system, first and foremost, but it will also allow 
for this word that I think it is now part of your DNA, it will allow for discrimination. Right? Um, and that activity um, that, that we are going to get into is known as um, grading. So we're going to look at the at grading exercise. How do I go about setting some relays to ensure that you know I get the discrimination? And by the way, this is something that you will have to do. That's why I'm teaching it so early. Okay, it's going to come up in your lab. It's going to come up in your project. All right? So you, you'll, have, you'll have to make these settings. All right? So we're going to go through, go through the grading exercise. Now, we can apply it to any configuration. Of course, as the configuration changes, the task you know, of, of grading becomes a little more difficult. When you reach utility, they will go through their um, steps in terms of grading. Uh, but for now, I'm going to just introduce you to a very simple system, simple radial system, all right, in terms of the, the calculations. So here's the system, and you already have it. Yeah? Now, it's, obviously, it's not clearly shown, but you, you, you have a grid supply point. Um, and that grid supply point is not necessarily a generator. As I said, it could be a substation, which means that the, the supply would be coming from your transformers. All right? It's just that you're being supplied at a grid point. Whatever, whatever, well, obviously, you know, coming off from a, from a substation, which means that you're feeding off the transformer. What we have here, these bus bars, you can think of them as, as no communities. So let's see now. Um, let's say this feeder is running up Hope Road, or Old Hope Road. So this would be going down to Mona. Um, this one is heading up to Papin. Right. This one is heading up to um, Opasius. Yeah. So these are our load points. Right. And the relays here, so you have a relay that is, and all these relays are looking at what is happening down here. So A is looking down, B is looking down, etc. Or depending on who you want to consider, maybe looking up. But it's looking down. All right. So this is the system we have. We have four relaying points right, along the feeder. And the question is, how do I coordinate these relays to ensure that um, to ensure that that when I have a fault down here? Only this guy operates. Or if I have a fault here, this fellow operates. But at the same time, I want to ensure that if I have a fault here, and this fellow we supposed to operate, if he doesn't operate, I want to ensure that only B operates. So if B operates, then um, the person's connected here and here would still have power. Only you know those beyond this point would lose power. Do you think? So how do we separate uh, the, the, the network? I know I'm showing circuit breakers here, right? But let's yeah, just, just think of them as um, I don't want to say fuses because obviously. The type of relay that I'm going to be using, which are very, uh, very inverse, you wouldn't be using them with fuses. But there, these are those um, switches that are connected to the relay that will open the circuit. All right? Okay, so that, that's, our, that's our, our network. 
So for the exercise, I have written them in, in I have alternated them in, in red and blue because I want to be clear in your mind about, about this. Before you start a grading exercise, these are the things that you must have. You must have a single line diagram of the network that you're going to be looking at. Two, you must have the capacity of the source. So what is the source at that? Um, well, what's the capacity of the source within the network? Thirdly, you want the symmetrical um, impedances. You want the plant impedances. Symmetrical components. Now, to the upfront, you may not necessarily need to calculate anything here. Because you would have also had the um, you know, so have the, the, the model of your system. So you, or even if you don't have the model of the system, once you can sketch this thing and create your single line diagram, you throw it into a program and you do your fault analysis because you have been exposed to uh, carrying out your fault, fault analysis on, on, on the network. All right? Now we mentioned motor starting current and fault curves were applicable because on the fault, depending on the size of the motor and the type of the motor, they will contribute to your fault current. All right. And then finally, we also need the CT and the relay information. So we need a single line diagram. We need the source capacities. Yeah, we need the um, symmetrical components, plant impedances. Yeah, we need the uh, motor information. In in other words, for the motor information, you'll be needing information for large manufacturers who may be along that feeder because they may um, under for contribute for current. So you, you need to know if you have a bottling plant that is being fed by this feeder when you're doing your calculations. Eh? And just a note, uh, we have this. Just as a note, one, when you're using these relays, you want to use relays having the same characteristics. So you're not going to mix IDMT and uh, not IDMT, very inverse and, and, and extremely inverse. It's not that it cannot be used. However, in terms of matching the curves, it makes life a lot easier. All right? If not that it can't be done, just that your calculations would, would be, you know, a lot simpler. And not that you're going up here selecting based on the, the, the difficulty of the calculations that you need to carry out. Another point I want to make before we, we jump into, into, into the exercise. So in terms of the relays, um, you're not going to use the same relay to protect against phase fault as against third fault. Because of course the settings are gonna be different. For your for your for your phase faults, you're gonna be using using the three phase fault. Current and so for your three phase four current, um, even though we didn't do any such calculation, but you would have seen it in, in the lab. Yeah, uh, for your three phase four current, you're gonna need just the voltage and the uh, positive sequence values for your earth release settings. 
you are going to need your single line to ground information, quality information. And so that would then be um, based on the on the voltage and um, your positive, negative, and zero sequence components. And of course, you are no experts on that. Eh? So we don't need to worry too much about that. Right. Well, you know, this COVID thing is having an effect. I, I can't even stand up for half an hour anymore. I used to stand up for two hours and I'm fine. You know, gravity is not having an effect. But anyway, um, Can I move on? Give me a second, please, sir. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. All right. So remember we spoke about discrimination, right? And this is just, um, but let's keep in mind that we, and we have already said this, you know, we have already spoken about this. You want to ensure that the, um, current setting is such, yes, that it is above maximum load, while at the same time below minimum fall current. So it must be above load or below minimum fall current. The other point that we want to make is that the, the impact of this is to ensure that the, the relay that is furthest from the grid has the most sensitive setting. And you will see that, you'll see why. And, uh, well, let, 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 me not, let me not make it a mystery. The, the further it is away from the grid, obviously it means that um, during fault it would see the lowest current. Yes? 
And because it is seeing the lowest current, then it means that the, um, the, 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 the sensitivity of that really would be highest. Right. Now, I know exactly what we have been saying here in power systems. And so the next point, I know we raise some, some eyebrows, but you know, nothing, nothing to worry about. So the rule of thumb I'm going to give you. In terms of our setting, we said that we would have used, you know, the plug setting, we wanted it just above the, the load. And, you know, when we're doing the, the assessment or the evaluation of our CT selection, uh, we give you certain percentages or in terms of the selection, we worked out the percentage above load. All right, so the, as a general rule, as a general rule, and, and we want to ensure that the relay current is greater than twice the load current. And this has its advantages, yeah? It has its advantages. Um, you know, among them, during maintenance, depending on the bus bar arrangement that you have, you may need to shift load, um, you know, within the system. So you shift load from um, one transformer to the next while you're doing, you know, switching operations. Now, you wouldn't want the system to then shut down simply because you have transferred load. So the, the sort of... Um, Criterion allows you to carry out um, certain activities without without disruption. All right, and at the same time, you want to ensure that it is less than half the minimum fault current. Now, the, the, the issue is, and I and note, I have I, I have put it in red. All right, so I still have blue. I put it in red. Because what you will actually select is going to be a compromise between the two, as you will see. So although I give it as a general, as the rule, what you want to ensure is that the load current will not result in the relay operating. And if you are exceeding the load current, remember we're talking now about utilities. It's not, it's not you know, at home where, you know, and even at home, you still have a little time if, you're, if your um, circuit is overloaded. You still have a little time to make um, adjustment. So the, the key here, the key objective is that you want your um, system to operate, not to operate under load current. All right? So we now go to, to the example. Any questions on this? I can move on. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay. okay. All right. Now, did I send you the question in the um, in school already? 
I will buy it. I will be those in the in the uh... yes, sir. Okay, good. All right, so we have an 11 kV system, and obviously at that voltage, we're dealing with a distribution. Yeah, and obviously, you know, we we, we know we operate at 24 in Jamaica, but we said point I'm making is that it's a distribution line. Um, and the, 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 the task for us is to choose the current settings for the um, inverse relay. Yes, at the four locations. The source capacity can vary between 75 and 150 MVA. And the line impedance are shown in the diagram. So in other, so where where we tap where we have the taps, you know, to go into the various communities, um, you know, we have a certain amount of impedance, and we want to assume that the relays have a nominal rating of five amperes. So the the the, the, the nominal current now would be, remember the formula that we gave you earlier, I nominal. Now we said that you can look at that nominal current on the um on, on, on the on the on the system side or meaning the, 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 the network side, or you can look at it um uh, coming from the CT. All right, so it's either the primary side or the secondary side. We are giving it here on the secondary, but of course, if it's nominal five amperes on the secondary and you have a 100 to 5 then the nominal on the primary would be 100. Is that clear? So the nominal we are giving here is the nominal on the secondary of the CT. But in your character, and you know, you, you, you'd agree that if I am dividing um, 5 million by, by 30,000, and I divide both, both the 5 million and the 30,000 by 20, I'm going to get the same answer. So if I divide what is on the system by the turns ratio, yeah, I'm going to end up with the same final result as if I had converted it and then divided it by only the five. Anyway, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not that critical. But the nominal rating is 5 amperes. And this is on the secondary side, obviously. And the plug settings, note, in terms of, in terms of what you have looked at so far with overcurrent relays, where you had top settings, what you had were current values. Agreed? This time around, what I'm giving you, and it's, it's no different, I'm just giving you percentages. So it will be percentages of, um, of, of the current settings that you have. So it is 50%, so it means that whatever the current is, it will be 0.5 of the current. Everybody with me? If it is 75%, it's 0.75. It's 200% it's two times. So we're not changing what you already know in terms of your top currents. So it's important that we understand that. Now, in terms of what we have up here, I mean, what do we mean by the capacity changes from 75 to 150? Remember, I explained that in terms of, in terms of your, um, your feeder, that will be coming from a substation which means that it is being fed by a transformer, yeah? Agree? So if the capacity can vary between 75 and 150, all we are saying is that that particular um, feeder can either have two 75 MVA transformers supplying it or one. So there are, there are instances where you have one or you will have two. So it's not that we have we are adding generation; it's the capacity that we are expand that we have created or expanded. So coming into that bus bar, which would be your substation, mm -hmm. you have a capacitor going a capacity 
sorry, going out to the 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 the, 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 um, the feeder of between seventy five and one fifty. So you either have one transformer operating, or you have two. Now if I have two transformers operating, it means that the um the 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 the, the reactants will be halved. When both are operating in parallel. Come on, man. When, when I see that sort of response from you, I start questioning whether or not you went through a network. So I should be able to just set that and move on quickly. All right? So if we have two sources, these are voltage sources. Think of them as ideal voltage sources. If I look at their equivalent reactants, it must be half when I have two of them in parallel. All right, so we just get that. So, you know, these things like to embarrass me. <laughs> That's weird. Let's get back to business. Good. So this is the network. So let's understand the network. So remember I told you about the communities. What was the popping, who passes, etc. So think of these loads. As going into those communities. All right, so you have this, let's say that is Papian. This is Mona. This is Hope Pastures. Which are the community nearby. Um, whatever. Um, this is Ligani. All right, so those are our communities. And this is the feeder from the Hope substation. So that's Hope substation. Okay. These now represent the impedance between each point that I have tapped. So between this the substation and Ligani. Well, this is, this is a bad example because you know, we really should be going up the road. Uh, the feeder can spread in two directions. But you understand the, the concept, right? So we have the re reactants, the impedance between each each point. We have the relaying point. Here's my relay. And the CT that is supplying each of these relays, we are given those. So we have for D, 100 to 5, for C, 200 to 5, 400 to 5 for, for B, and 400 to 5 for A. And we want to know, first, first task was to um, determine just the current setting. So remember, how many settings do we need for your over current relay? How many settings we need for the overcurrent? Two, sir. Two. Two. All right, so we're gonna start with the current setting. All right. So, did I give you this table? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, all right. So let's now look at how we go about filling this out. Are you going to do some calculations so so that you, you are comfortable with it. Up top, we talk about the in-zone impedance. Now look at where A is connected. All right? Now A, 
will be right at that bus. And the minimum in-zone impedance from A that it would see would be, I mean, right at the tip would be the, 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 the impedance of the source. So for that point, for that point, when we get the point eight one, right, is that we we calculate the impedance as per um, <clears throat> the two the two um, transformers connected in parallel. So the voltage there is eleven k, okay? so it's eleven squared over one fifty. MV, uh, we get 0.8. It's not exactly 0.81, um, but this was, yeah, I wasn't very nice or keen on the on maintaining the standard as far as the decimal place is concerned. Right. So we have maximum capacity, which is the 150. We have the minimum in zone impedance which would be 11 squared over 150. So you just confirm that. Make sure my math's right. All right. And then for the max, since I have already rounded out for the point eight one, well, let me wait on you. Have you confirmed the point eight one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, good. And for the max, because we have the denominator, so we are now going to go to 75, then obviously this would double to 1.62. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. The internet went does you explain the 0 0.81. Can you repeat it, please? That is with both transformers in place. So with them in parallel, the total MVA would be 150. And so the point A to one would be V squared over, over S. So we get 11 squared over 150. That's how we get the point eight one. With a, with a 1.62, that's with one transformer in, so it would now be 11 squared over 75. But we don't really need to work that out because we know this is at 150. So at 75, then it must double. So we get 1.62. So if we're now looking at the um, in-zone fault current, remember now we're still focusing on relay A, right? For the in-zone fault current, if we have the in-zone impedance, and in-zone fault current would be the voltage, which is 11 over root 3 divided by the point eight one. And that gives us our 7840. Which therefore gives us our 3920 for, 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 for minimum. So the maximum would correspond, the maximum would correspond to the minimum impedance. X, X. Double X, double X. All right. All right, go. Anybody, can you remind me? 
as to why we need to go through a grading exercise. What did I say? What's the purpose of going through this grading exercise? Sir, would that be to ensure that you have discrimination? Absolutely. So if I'm going to look at really A, which really would it be providing backup for? That would be to really B. All right. No. It therefore means that relay A must operate if relay B has a problem. Yes, sir. So, so in terms of the minimum fault, and by the way, oh, well, you know what? Before I go there, before I go there, let's just finish the table. And uh, you can do the calculations on, on your time. All right. Um any questions regarding those, those, um, oh, come on, Zach. But I tell them I think they're them too big, you know. We're on this thing I need to do. Ah, beautiful. In terms of really A, everybody comfortable up to that point? Now, let's look at the loads. So I'm gonna look at the loads for each of these relays. If we go back to the network. All right, relay D, can we see that it will have 50, 50 amperes? Very comfortable with that. Relay C, what load current will it see and why? We see 130, sir. Why? Because it has to have the 80 at load, load right after C and then the one after D. Okay, so it's carrying this community load and that community load. So that's how we get the 130. All right? Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. And, and, and also, if you go, go to B, it will now add the 170. So that's how we get the 300. All right? And then A would have to see all the loads. So the maximum load current would be 50, 130, 300, 420. We're good with that? I know it kind of heavy tonight, you know, but you're a creme de la creme, so let's move on, eh? Sir, could you go with that one more time, please? For the load currents? Yes, sir. All right, so here's your network. All right. Relay D must see 50 as its maximum load because the 50 amperes is, is, is feeding into that community. Remember, I named all of these as communities. So community D, C, B, A. You give them names, huh? This is the feeder coming from the substation. The 50 amperes in terms of maximum load must pass through D. For C, it must carry C and D. as maximum load. So it must carry the community immediately after it, and it must carry the community down the road. When we go to B, it must carry B, C, and D. 
So we have 130 plus 170 to give us 300. And then when we come to community A, or relay A, it must carry all four communities. All right? So that's how we get okay, the, the 50, 130, 300, 420. All right? We, have, we were already given the CT ratios, so we're not going to change that. All right? We're not going to change that. So if we know, go back to our, our, our network. Let's go back to the network. Remember the minimum in zone fault. I always speak of minimum in zone fault. The best way of thinking about it is what is the circumstance immediately in front of the relay. So when we calculated this point eight one, because the relay um, was situated at this point, we can remember you know, the, 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 the bus bar represents where the relay really is located, all right? But we can't draw it inside the bus bar. So we show it immediately in front. So if there was a fault right at the bus bar, Right at the tip of the of the of the relay, right in front of the relay. The only reactance between the source and the relay would have been the transformers, which is why we, we just did that. Are you it? So if I now go to relay B, relay B is on this bus bar. So relay B, the, in, the impedance immediately in front relay B must be the source plus the line. And so we go to our table. And in our table, we are getting 0.81 plus 0 0.6, which gives us comfortable that if not say your piece similarly if this is the maximum in zone for a then we add the 0.6 we get the maximum in zone for b and we continue We add the point nine five in order to get to C, and then we add the two point two in order to get to D. This is the minimum in zone, a maximum in zone. Okay, so we have those reactances, and in order to get these currents, we're just going to be dividing the eleven over root three by each. So if you have the, mark, the, the minimum in zone at B, it will be 11 over root 3 divided by 1.41. Uh, Alright? Minimum in zone, it will be 11 over root 3 divided by 4.56 and 5.37. Any questions? We good? All right. Now, the next thing we need to determine in this table, um, or the next thing we need to determine, know that we have all the fault and load information. Remember, we gave it the, the rule at all. We want half minimum fault, twice maximum load. Now, if I started with relay A, what is the smallest 
fall current that I want really A to respond to. So that we do 3,920. That, that is the minimum in zone fall for A. But what do I want it to respond to? Remember, always keep in the back of your head, students, that the purpose of grading is to provide discrimination. So what's the smallest fault I want A to be able to respond to? Based on this table, which current would I want A to respond to, to be able to respond to? Will that be the 420, sir? No, man, but that is a load. That's a load current. Sir. No, A, you know. Sir, it would be half of the 3920. All right. So I'll I push you on this one. <laughs> What's the purpose of this? You see, I'm repeating this because I want it to stick. Eh? What's the purpose of um, grading? Talk to me, no one. Ensure that they're right. You're going to have to mute one of your devices. Ensure that Sometimes. they're right. Right, early operates the correct early operates. So you want discrimination, yes, and to get discrimination, A would 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 play what role, and for what? What role would A need to play? Uh, well, A A would need to ignore. The faults that happen in the other locations. But BCMB. can it ignore it forever? Up, up to a certain um, point. Which point? Up to what point should it For, ignore well, it? Well, at the maximum, the, mi uh, the, the minimum fault here that A can, that A should operate is 3920. So anything below that it no, no, you know, we didn't say anything about operation. You know. All I have calculated are the in-zone fault currents. All right, all right. I know it's late, so let me work with it. Let me help you. A must provide backup for B. So in other words, Ideally, if a fault occurs that B is required to clear, yeah, and it doesn't clear it, A is supposed to back it up. So the discrimination here occurs because in the normal course of things, A would ignore what is happening in B because you want B to operate when it has a fault. Agreed? But yes. in the event B doesn't operate, you want A to clear the fault. Yes? And what you want is that B must operate when it has its minimum fault current. So you are going to choose a setting for A that will back up B when B is seeing its minimum current. So let me try to put that in. Well, I have put it in writing. So here it is. So it must provide backup for faults in the zone protected by B. It's not going to override B, you know. Yeah? But it will back up B.
So it's setting. Remember, we spoke about minimum file current. So it is it's setting is going to be based on what's happening with B. So it's half the B current, which is 1430, and twice its load current, which is 840. All right, now here's where the conundrum comes. Here's the conundrum. What are the available settings we have for the relay? From, from what to what? Same percentages. Yeah, man. From what, 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 what's the range? 50 to 200 percent. 50 to 200. Yeah? And what is the um what is the 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 the, 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 the turns ratio of the CT at A? Eight. Four hundred to five. Okay. Now, based on the settings that I have there, what would then be the maximum that I can get? in terms of the relay current, the relay setting current. Look at what we have just calculated. But you also are now restricted by what the relays are able to operate at. What's the maximum setting? What's the maximum percentage? 200. What's the CT setting? 400. So what's the maximum I can get from this? So would it be 800? 800. All right. And there in nice students, the beauty that I find in protection. It is not about you being able to do maths. All right? It's about you understanding what you're doing and making the compromise, which is what we have just done. So we have a relay. The relay gives us 200%. Which means that the setting that we are going to make for A would be for a relay current of 800 amperes, which corresponds to the 200%. So I am restricted by what is available on my relay. Any questions? So what we are saying is that A, because this is the whole purpose of us doing the grading, to coordinate the relays so that they support each other. But you also want to ensure that only the relay, um, which is protecting a particular area, operates during a fault. So remember when you were doing, when you were looking at zones, you would have had the zone that that um, covers the first part of the network. The zone that covers here, it would go all the way down. Yeah. So it would be overlapping that. 
and then that will be looking like that. Right? Good. In this case, however, we're not looking at anything in the reverse, so the overlap would only be going forward. So at A, we are saying that it must be able to operate in the event B does not operate for its smallest fault. If I, if I didn't do that, students, if I didn't do that, look at what would happen. If I were to set A, if I were to set A based on 3920, you realize how close 3920 is to the maximum for that B? So if I have put it at 3920, B could have been experiencing a fault at 2860, yeah, or 3000, for example. Yes. Question Wouldn't that 3000 amperes be passing through A? Yes, sir. But A's minimum fall is 3920. So it wouldn't have been providing much help to B. Because, you know, it hasn't even seen its minimum fall yet. So, big deal. You know, B is the only are sweating, but who cares? So, A must be set in such a way that it will respond, albeit slower. It must respond. Remember, I gave you that example with the fire truck or the fire stations. All of them see the fault, but only the one closest to the fault should um, extinguish the fire. So A will see the minimum fault at B. C would see, B would see the minimum fault at C. C would see the minimum fault at D. Where D is concerned, we now have to go to the end of the line which would result in the minimum fault on the system. So all we would do at the end of the line is to now add the, that remainder that we, we didn't put in, which was the 1.1. Um, the, the and that's how we get the 491. All right. So let's, 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 let's go back to our table. So, so we have this? Do we have this? All right. So the next table that you have is this. So the 1430, the 1430 would be half the minimum fault at B, and the 840 would be twice the maximum load at A. And the compromise is 800. Amperes, which represents 200%. At B, it's half the minimum fault at C and twice the minimum, the, the maximum load at B. So we use a selection of 600, which corresponds to 150% of the 400 to 5. For C, it's a minimum fault current at D. So this would be B, this would be C, and that's D, and twice the maximum load at C. All right? And for D, as I said before, we would simply be adding this, the 1.1 1 .1 to um, to the 1 .1 values here in order to get, well, to, to the value here in order to get the minimum fault. 
Do you with me? So this would be 982, I think. All right? And then C would correspond to that minimum current because the minimum fault, minimum fault current would occur if I went to the end of the line. The minimum in-zone current, in-zone fault current would have occurred up here. But the minimum that it would see, that B would see, would occur at the end of the line because it would now have to go through the additional 1.1. I know it's a lot to take in, but I want you to go through those tables that that we that we looked at this evening, right? Go through the tables, and then uh, when do we meet? It's tomorrow. Tomorrow when we meet, we have a discussion about it in the first part of the class, and then we look at how we go about doing the, the time setting, and that's it for your overcurrent release. Excuse me, sir. Hello? Yes? Um, I can go back over one thing, sir. Go ahead. Um, the, the 800 and the 200 percent uh, can just re-explain because it seemed that we chose the two hundred percent and then the eight hundred, but then in re-explaining it, it sounds like the eight hundred came first. And but, all right, it is since you put it that way, I'm gonna throw it back at you and say it's chicken and egg. All right, we have the setting here is four hundred to five. Agreed. The multiplied. Remember, I said that in terms of the plug setting multiplier that I have here, you can either look on the primary or the secondary side. All these currents that we're looking at here is on the primary. Yes, Good. So if we are setting based on the primary, we have it, we, we want it between 14, 14 30 and 840. But with a 400 to 5 CT, there is no such setting on the relay. So the only setting we have would be the 200% times the 2 times 4, which gives us 800 amperes. So I, the setting on the relay would be 800. Remember, you know, the CT is fixed. And what we are doing in setting the relay is to find the current at which the relay will operate. And the settings I have are 200%, 150%, 100%, etc. Those are the settings I have. I rest the point that what you, are, what you have been exposed to thus far would just be the top current, eh? So you would say this is a top setting. So you'd have selected a current value. This relay is giving you a multiplier. Well, I, 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 the, 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 the deafening silence feels like I have lost. Not just Mr. Johnson, but the whole crew. Uh, no, sir. I, I get what you're saying, sir. The relay only has one set value, so the multiplier adjusts it. So it's of the 400. So if we wanted to go to the 800, we have to choose the 200%. That's multiplier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go it over again. Um, spend a couple of minutes with, with the record. Well, you're not going to get the recording right now because I'm going home. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, I'll make it available, all right? And then tomorrow we look at the time setting, all right? Have a good one, okay, sir. You too, all right, take care.